guest is at the door. He comes to earthly dwelling still with new year gifts of peace, good will. Oh, join with me in gladness sing to keep our Christmas with our King until our song from loving souls like rushing mighty water rolls. Welcome to worship for Sunday, January 2nd. It's the second Sunday of Christmas. Happy New Year. Our lessons today talk about two boys who go to church. The boy Samuel and the boy Jesus, both in temple, both growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and humankind. We too have returned to the house of God to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God, who has gifted us with a Savior. As this festival continues, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It is Christmas still. Hi kids. Hey, did y'all have a good Christmas? I'm wondering if you're about to take your Christmas tree down or if maybe you've already done that. Well, don't feel bad because there's part of Christmas that we can still talk about and that's the visit of the three wise men or the three kings. We actually don't know if there were three of them or if they were all men. They probably weren't kings. They were more like wise people. And this coming Wednesday is called Epiphany. Sometimes we call it the Three Kings Day. And I brought this book. This was a gift from Pastor Deanna. It's called The Not-So-Wise Man. And it was written by Alan McDonald with illustrations by Alan Rowland. Let's read it together. And I want you to think about what you would like to say to this not-so-wise man. Ashtar was wise, the wisest in the land, so people said. He lived alone in a tall, windswept tower at the top of a hill. People came from far and wide to listen to Ashtar's great learning. They crowded into Ashtar's tower, sitting on the stairs and peering through the door. Ashtar told them about a time to come when a great king would be born. A wise man should be ready, he said, for this child will come from heaven itself. When the last visitor had gone, Ashtar climbed the winding stairs to the top of his tower and gazed up into the sky, as he did every night. The stars shone like a spray of diamonds. Ashtar knew each one and counted them off in his head. Suddenly he stopped. His old heart leaped. There, in the midnight blue, was the sign he'd been waiting for, a new star in the sky. He ran downstairs and threw his scrolls and a clean nightshirt into his bag. A wise man travels light. The star was calling him to follow. The king from heaven was about to be born, and Ashtar longed to see the child for himself. All night he journeyed, following the bright star. He crossed great mountains and crept by villages, sleeping under the pale moon. At last, crossing a plain, he met some travelers dressed in rich silks and furs. Who do you think they are? There are three of them. That one looks like a lady. But like I said, we don't know if they were all men. We have come a long way and our camels are tired, they said. Do you know anywhere we can find water? Ashtar put his ear to the ground and listened. Then he stood up and sniffed the wind. Over that hill, you'll find a pool of water where you can rest and drink, he said. The travelers marveled at Ashtar's wisdom. They asked him to join them on their journey. We too are following a star. Why not come with us? But Ashtar shook his head. A wise man travels alone, he said. Eager to be on his way, Ashtar left the travelers and set off on his quest again. There he goes. The next night, Ashtar heard voices calling. Three shepherds came out of the darkness, carrying torches. 
What are you looking for? Ashtar asked them. One of our sheep, said the shepherds. It's run away. Ashtar pointed to a tuft of wool caught on a bush. Follow the trail into the woods. That's where you'll find your sheep. The shepherds found the sheep, just as Ashtar had said. They begged him to stop and warm himself by the fire. The night is cold and the road is long. Stay with us and talk a while. It's not often we meet such a clever man. Thank you, but I must go on with my journey, said Ashtar. A wise man has few words to spare. And away he goes. So Ashtar rode on his way, thinking it must be the wind singing so softly over the hills. Oh, look up there. That's not the wind. They look like angels. Before long, he reached a small town where the streets were crowded with people. He knocked at the door of an inn. The innkeeper stuck his head out impatiently. No room. We're full. How many times do I have to tell people? Ashtar smiled. A wise man would put a sign on the door. That way he could get some peace. The idea had never occurred to the innkeeper. He wrote, no room on a sign and nailed it to the door. The next people who came to the door didn't knock. They saw the sign and turned away, sadly, the man leading his donkey with a pale, weary woman on its back. There they are. Who do you think they are? The innkeeper watched them go and was delighted. He'd get some peace at last. To show Ashtar his thanks, he promised to find him a bed for the night. Past midnight, Ashtar woke up. The star shone through his window, filling the room with silver light. Ashtar dressed hurriedly and went out. He walked through the still, silent streets, searching. Perhaps it was in this very town that the child from heaven would be born. Look at those people on the, on the camels. Do you know who they are? At last, beside a small inn, he came to a ramshackle stable. Ashtar could hear cows lowing inside. Grazing under a tree were a donkey and a flock of sheep. He wondered who would own so many animals. But it was no business of his. He had come looking for a king, and he wasn't foolish enough to think that a poor stable was the place. Look who's inside. Sighing deeply, Ashtar turned back and went on his way. The wisest man in all the land was going home, none the wiser. What would you like to say to him? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Shine into our hearts the light of your wisdom, O God, and open our minds to the knowledge of your word, that in all things we may think and act according to your good will, and may live continually in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 2. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother, Hannah, used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift that she has made to the Lord. And then they would return to their home. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Colossians chapter 3. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. 
bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your heart. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the second chapter, beginning with verse 41. Glory to you, O Lord. Now every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to them, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you in peace. Well, it was a family outing that went wrong before it went right. Thinking about the 12-year-old Jesus and his family joining the stream of people leaving Jerusalem, I thought of an excursion I once went on. This goes back to college days. A friend and I, who sometimes went to a Bible study, learned of a church picnic at a park. Now, it was not our church or, uh, or anyone in the group's church. It was just this, this church that we knew of that was having this event. It was an open invitation. And I can't remember where it was, but the, the gathering itself was going to be at some place that it entailed some hiking to get there. Well, we didn't see our friends at the trailhead, so finally we started walking. And along the way, we asked people on the trail if they'd seen the rest of our party. We said, have you seen this couple? He's bald and she has blonde hair and they have three little blonde kids. And then there should be three girls about our age with short, dark hair. And we were quite encouraged by the number of people who had seen them not that long ago. Well, we never found them. Later on, we discovered that the event had either been postponed or the place had been changed or maybe this third hand invitation that we'd had was wrong to begin with. But all these people could have sworn that they saw our friends. None of them were ever there. And I reflect on that experience when I think of Mary and Joseph managing to think that Jesus was uh, somewhere in this flood of people leaving Jerusalem. People certainly can tell you mistakenly that they found somebody that you're looking for even when there's quite a specific description. Another story, this was a friend of mine, a little older than I am, 
who was caught up as a middle schooler in the incarceration of Americans of Japanese descent in World War II. And the family had been living in San Jose, so uh, they didn't have to put up with the muddy uh, uh, Puyallup fairgrounds where the first um, assembly area was. And Alice's parents tried to shield her from the worst of the indignities by telling her that the whole thing was for their own protection. Well, as she got older, she realized that that was not true and that they had been very badly wronged. But she has said a number of times, I've even seen it quoted in the newspaper, that at her age, in her early teens, she actually thought camp was kind of fun. Because even though one of the daily indignities for the parents was not being able to have family meals um, in their own home. Alice, at that age, she only wanted to run around and hang out with her friends. She was the oldest in a, a fairly large family, and the last thing that she wanted to do was sit around the table with them, like the Waltons. Gives an idea of how desperately someone the age of Jesus in this story wants to hang out with friends, that they would think that incarceration in this racist camp uh, relocation camp was sort of liberating. So if we have trouble squaring the scene of Mary and Joseph uh, losing Jesus after th for three days, after all, when, if you believe that you, you've been given responsibility for parenting the Son of God, and then you lose him, it would be quite natural for a youngster to want to break away from his parents when there were relatives and acquaintances, safe people around in the assembly. If we were to, uh, to back up a verse in this passage, we would find that since his dedication in the temple, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And the passage ends with almost the same statement. So this was not a child who behaved foolishly and got into trouble. He must have um, earned some trust from his parents. Of course, Jesus wasn't in the crowd. He never had left the temple, and he assumed that his parents knew that he was there. Maybe he thought that they were still in the city and they'd come and get him when they really needed to get underway. Well, why is this vignette in Luke? Luke was one of the later Gospels written, so maybe he was responding to requests to know something about Jesus as a child or as a youth. Uh, we learn that Jesus was very unusual in his maturity and his understanding of Scripture, that he understood God as his Father. And this was not necessarily from whatever Mary had told him about the angel Gabriel, but feeling this close connection with God. And later he would teach us in that prayer that he gave to the disciples that we should all feel this connection with God. There are no other stories of Jesus' childhood. There are none from his early adulthood that were considered credible enough to make it into the Bible. Maybe this account is intended to be representative of the sort of person that he was. In his human nature, he had a lot to learn about that growing up task that we all have of learning to see things from another person's point of view. How his parents did not have perfect insight and how frightened they would be to discover that he was missing. This little account puts us in awe of Jesus being so wise and so dedicated to the will of God. It's also a corrective to the notion that he had a divine nature, but no human one. It's also a corrective to the notion, uh, by the way, that turned into quite a serious heresy in church history, this notion that he had no human nature. Uh, it's a corrective to the idea that Jesus was born knowing everything, needing no help with anything, never getting frustrated with his parents. So even though the story begins and ends with no miracle and no wisdom sayings from Jesus, we actually learn quite a bit about him from the story. And going along the way, we also have little glimpses of others who were present uh, at at this time when Jesus was showing the craving for the temple at the age of 12. There were other people there too. And it struck me on reading this, this reading of the story uh, that this is just about the only time that anyone associated with the temple is depicted in a positive light. Jesus seems to have found intellectual soulmates in these uh, teachers in the temple. He asked them questions. 
From here on, we're going to hear about chief priests and scribes and experts in the law who are always on the defensive toward Jesus because they're afraid of losing their influence to him. They are all about keeping the letter of the law. Jesus sees the law as something that should be of service to people, not the other way around. Well, the local synagogue is where we would expect to find rabbis functioning as teachers. Synagogues weren't places for sacrifice. They were just for study and prayer and worship. And Jesus taught in a lot of them. But sometimes these places could be legalistic too. Throwing him out for healing someone, which you'd think would only be a good thing. But throwing him out for healing someone on the Sabbath. Or casting out a demon on the Sabbath. In the story from Luke, the teachers in the temple and, and anyone else who was around didn't show any of this animosity. Just as Jesus is showing this youthful innocence of thinking, of thinking, of course, his parents know where he is. Of course, anyone would want to study with the rabbis. Just as Jesus shows this um, youthful innocence, it's as if the teachers in the temple are showing a, a kind of childlike innocence, too. What happened to that? that by the end of his life, Jesus was so often at odds with the people in the temple. Well, for one thing, these seem to be the sort of people who are occupied with studying the scriptures, and their focus wasn't on enforcing the law. They spared themselves all that legalism. And they seem not to be competitive and intimidated by a 12-year-old. He was a prodigy, sure. And maybe when they were 12-year-olds, if someone their same age came along showing them up, Maybe they would have resented that. But as adults, they weren't intimidated by a child. It was probably a delight for the, a teacher to find a child who actually wanted to study these things. As he grew into a man, Jesus did not want to be punitive to various teachers and leaders, even though he would often be corrective. As a 12-year-old, Jesus could have a real dialogue with the teachers. We're told that he listened to the teachers. He asked them questions, and the teachers were amazed at his understanding, understanding of their answers, presumably, and then he added his own answers. When he was older, Jesus would give sermons like the Sermon on the Mount. He taught in the synagogues, but he also had conversations with people. He liked to answer their questions by throwing a question back to them. His assumption was that people could draw on their ideas and knowledge to come to their own answers. He respected people enough not to always be dictating to them. Well, we don't know if these same teachers were still living 20 years later, but their successors had more of the sense of a pecking order, and they assumed that he did too. Instead, Jesus the man only clashed with temple authorities because they clashed with him. He wanted bad teaching to stop, he wanted the temple to look out for the poor. He knew that the people who were so stuck on themselves and on their own piety, they'd be much happier if they looked out toward God and toward other people, looked out to their neighbors. It wasn't a point of pride for Jesus to be the champion of these ideas. His intention was to bless people with them. Sometimes the stories about Jesus and the Pharisees and the chief priests and scribes Sometimes those are unpleasant reminders to us of how we don't want to be. Pause for a minute and think how it would be if we could get back to the delight and amazement of the teachers in the temple. If we could encounter other people and not have the expectation of an adversarial relationship. I used to get so frustrated with that homeless newspaper, Real Change, because uh, they went through a phase at least where they had so many articles about apartment tenants not knowing their rights. And the, it became that the, the tenor of the whole thing was how to do battle with your landlord or your manager, assuming that they were out to cheat you. And of course, if you're taught that your approach ought to be to see what you can get away with, you are going to be seen as an undesirable tenant. We see our Congress constantly stalled because no one can conceive of not being at odds with one another. Or that grabbing the spotlight, the top of the pecking order, that is not the object of governing. That is the attitude of a Pharisee or, or chief priest. We do not have to assume an adversarial relationship with other people. 
and we can be quite tr innocently trusting about Jesus' intentions for us, that he's respectful, enjoys our company, exploring with us as we journey through life, not wanting us to look or feel foolish or deficient, but to find our way along with him. And then there was Mary, and she seems to be the, the dominant parent here. We still have her words to the angel Gabriel ringing in our ears. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. She had made herself ready and available for, for, for whatever lay in store when she said that. And this was a test of that. It was probably one of many trying episodes trying to parent the Son of God. We will see how when he was a grown man, she went out searching for him, apparently not knowing in that moment what his ministry had turned into. But she had set an example for herself when she was perplexed by Jesus. She lived with a mystery. Remember how she pondered even the greeting of the angel. Remember how she pondered the visit from the angels as they, they told her the story of how the, the angels, uh, the, the shepherds were, were uh, visited by the angels telling, telling them to visit the manger. And here we're told that she didn't understand Jesus' behavior when he told her that he just had to be in the temple. But she accepted that mystery and treasured the whole thing in her heart. And that's all right for us to do too when we don't understand what God is doing. I would like to have the nature of the child Jesus at the age of 12. I think that I would settle for the character of the teachers in the temple, to learn like a little child from the child who came to them. Amen. And our next hymn, "'Twas in the Moon of Winter Time." It's an old French tune with words by a missionary who enjoy, he introduced Christianity to the Huron nation. So listen for the Christmas and Epiphany story as it might be told by Native Americans.
now joining our voices with the heavenly host and with Christians throughout time and space, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. O oh God, you come to us in gatherings of your church across the globe. Unite us with those who celebrate your birth, even when they are weighed down by grief, loss, poverty, hunger, or injustice. You come to us in the diverse splendor of the universe. Grant us the humility to trust our place in the network of creation that we live in service to you and the natural world. You come to us through relationships of many kinds, families, friendships, teachers, communities, nations. Guide us in these relationships, that we recognize the Christ child in one another and show your love to those most vulnerable. You come to us through people whom the world forgets, poor shepherds, and an imprisoned Paul announced your good news. Send your spirit to all who are imprisoned, struggling with addiction, unwell, or any in need this day, especially Joanne, John, Loretta, David, Gordon, Cannon, Joe, Juanita, and Mina at the death of Ray. You come to us in acts of justice and forgiveness, Open our hearts to forgive one another without permitting injustice. Supply us with the wisdom to be clothed with love, binding all things together in perfect harmony. Rejoicing in your word made flesh among us, we commend these prayers to you, confident of your grace and love made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us pray now using the words that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Now go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ah. Uh -huh.